Hello and welcome to this Oak Tree English tutorial on how to pass your GCSE exam part two. If you're concerned about having not taken, not seen part one, that's okay. I didn't make, I haven't made it yet. Uh, perhaps I will in the future. Who knows? However, today we're going to talk about how to pass your EDUCAS paper two. First, we're going to talk about exam conditions. There are a few don'ts and do's when you're in an exam room. Let's have a look at some of the do's first. Make sure you do write in black ink. You should have a black pen with you. In fact, you should have two or three just in case one doesn't work. You should, if you have a question or problem or need the toilet, you should raise your hand and wait for an invigilator to come to you. Don't just stand up and start dancing. Don't wet yourself and don't do anything silly like uh, shout out, Oi, I need the toilet! That's not going to help anyone. So uh, fill in your details on the front of your sheet. You don't have to wait to be told that. As soon as you sit down and you've got your paper in front of you, you can write your name, your candidate number, your centre number, all on the front. Don't open your booklet because that'll make everyone very unhappy. Be considerate of other people. Don't be silly and, uh, and yes, don't dance on the tables. You know who you are. And ladies and gentlemen, please, 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 please read the question. Make sure you're answering the question that has been asked. You're going to think that sounds stupid, but you'd be amazed how many people don't. Talking of don't, please don't take your phone into your room. If you can leave it in the car, great, leave it in the car. If you can leave it in your at home, then leave it at home. Don't take a phone into the room. This year you're not allowed to put, wear watches, not, not smart watches, nor watches that look smart, just bare wrists, please. Uh, don't take in any notes. This sounds stupid, but, you know, don't wear, take any notes. You're not allowed to wear hats in case you've got notes in them. Uh, if you go to the toilet, the toilets then have to be inspected to make sure you haven't left any notes around. It, this, is, this is fairly fundamental. Uh, have I mentioned no phones? If you do take your phone into the room, it needs to be turned off and left in a bag at the front of the room. Please just don't do it. If your phone rings and uh, rings or if you are caught with a phone, it's instant disqualification. Just don't do it. There should be no labels on water bottles. I don't think you're likely to sn sneak notes in, in in under the labels, but you've got to be careful. There's no labels on water bottles. There's no talking. In fact, there's no communication with anyone else within the room except the invigilator and then only by raising your hand. And in case I haven't mentioned it before, no blessed phones. Don't take them in. Leave them alone. These are exam conditions. In this exam, there are two texts that you will be looking at. One is a 19th century text, that's 1800 to 1899, um, the years of the reign of Her Majesty Queen Victoria, uh, and all of the wonderful things of the, uh, the British Empire, which of course was a totally ben benevolent organization that never did any harm Let's move on from that quickly uh, and say, say that the other one will be a 21st century uh, text. That is a text from our own time, the time of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. God bless her. Long may she reign. These texts will both be transactional and pers or persuasive. That is, they will try to persuade you to do something or to think a certain way. So when you first get those texts, what I would urge you to do is survey them. That means skim read, read them fast, let your eyes skim over the page. I don't expect you to read them in detail first off. Scan for any difficult words. The 19th century text may contain some archaic words which we don't use, uh, use very much anymore. So make sure you you can see them if you can get the context of them and understand them by context. 
Uh, read the first and last sentences of paragraphs that will give you the topic sentences of those paragraphs. Remember, this will be factual information, so you read it like you're looking for factual information. Section A is the reading section. And this will be, <laughs> enjoy this, this will be two unseen texts represented here by The Invisible Man, The Invisible Man by H.G. Wells and Daniel, Danielle Steele's Invisible. See what I've done there. Um, now the marks here, the, it's 50% of the paper marks, is, so it's it's 40 marks for the reading, 40 marks for the writing, so 50% of the paper marks, but it's actually 30% of the overall marks for the whole exam. So the first paper had 40% 40 40 of the mark, uh, weighting, 40% weighting, this one has a 60% weighting, and this is half of that, therefore 30% of your entire overall um overall mark I therefore take it seriously is all i'm saying there not that not that i doubt not that i suspect any of you would do otherwise um you got 40 marks 20 mark uh, so 40 marks for section a there's 40 marks for section b um the writing uh this will be broken down per question so we'll look at this as we go there are two questions on text one, two questions on text two, and two questions on both. Uh, on In each one, it'll be a small question and a large question, a small question and a large question, a small question and a large question. You should be aware of that and time it appropriately. Question one, let's, let's just go straight into this. Um, question one is in three parts, A, B and C, and it is comprehension. It's worth three marks, one mark for A, one mark for B, one mark for C. It's a scanning exercise. You have been doing comprehension since primary school. You know how to do it. You are simply answering questions about what the paper says, about what the text says. This is not complicated, which is why there's only three marks. It is, it's nice and easy. So I'm not going to waste any time on telling you how to do a comprehension exercise. Now, question two. This is your 10 point question. Um, for the, the, the ten, 10 mark question for the first text. And it is, how does the writer how does the writer create this impression? How does the writer uh, communicate this fact? How does the writer uh, make you feel yada, yada, yada? You've got to comment on what they say and the use of language, tone and structure. And if you can think of any other things to, to say, then go ahead. As I said, this is 10 marks, so one to take seriously. The, you should look to write, get to find about six to nine short quotes from the beginning, middle and end. And you should be writing in, you should write a, about a minimum of three paragraphs. Each paragraph should have the P structure. P E E. Yes, I'm telling you to P on the page. Um, this is where, where you write your point in your first sentence, probably your evidence and your ex explanation. And if you would like to be clever and get all the marks you can, I would I would urge you to make it then make, make them peat question paragraphs and include a technique in there. So. Your, your point is uh, the writer does this by your ex your explanation is your quote. Um, they use a um, they say 
that the water was like crystal, making us think of it being very, uh, very pure. Making this up on the spot. Uh, ex explanation. Uh, this uh, this choice of simile. It was like crystal. See what we're doing there. Um, this choice of simile creates an image of um, a beautifully clear water, beautifully pure water, perhaps. Uh, I, I hope that makes sense. You're looking for three, maybe more paragraphs, each one peating. Peat, peat, peat. Point, explanation, evidence, technique. And then on to question three. Question three is another comprehension one, which you've still been doing since uh, since primary school and which you know how to do. This is a quick and easy one. Don't spend too much time. It's A, B and C again. It's comprehension again and it's three marks again. There's no there's no tricks here. Question four. This is a, again, this is your um, your 10 mark question for text two. So, highlight six to nine short quotes from the beginning, the middle and the end. And start it off with an opinion. I probably ought to tell you this is a how far do you agree question in which you should comment on what they say, how they say it and it's worth 10 marks. So you, can, you should start off with your opinion. I fully agree. I somewhat agree. I partially agree. I totally disagree. Um, and then you can back that up with three or more peat paragraphs. That is point, explanation, evidence and technique. Um, so what they say so how far do you agree that's your point what they say is your evidence excuse me your, your evidence and also your explanation how they say it's where you'll put in your technique and that's how you and you will get your your marks for that um you uh, you'd be looking for three three paragraphs minimum aim for Aim for four or five. Um, four, possibly. Um, yeah. Back up your back up your point every time with a quote. Bringing us on to question five. Now, question five is where you're starting to talk about both texts. You know, um, you're bringing them together. And in this case, you're putting things in your own words. It's worth four marks this time. Three plus three plus four equals ten. And then you've got three ten mark questions. Thus, you've got 40 marks for your whole exam. Woohoo! OK, um, so this is your, your quick, easy one. Don't spend huge amounts of time on it because it's only worth four marks. But you've got to do it. You've got to do it properly. You've got to take it seriously. Here you are summarizing two relevant ideas from both texts. This is not the place where you're comparing the two texts. This is just the place where you're explaining what they say. So you find two ideas and then you put them into your own words. So you can, if you need to, use very short quotes, like one or two word quotes, very short quotes, if you need to. But you should be able, you should be prepared to say what that means. Explain it. Um, the, the, yeah. So that's question five. What you really want to know is how to answer question six. Question six, this is your comparison. 
This is where you compare the two. Um, and remember that you need to talk about what and how. OK. So and this is your 10 mark both text questions. So to answer the what part, you need to look for one similarity with evidence, one difference with evidence, and write at least two, if not more, uh, P's. That's point, evidence, and explanation paragraphs. For your how part, that's where you put in your terminology. So how do they do this? They use a metaphor. The, um, the soldier was a lion in the fight. The soldier fought bravely. So you can say that in the 19th century text um, written by um, Kipling, just grabbing a 19th century author, um, it, he talks about, he uses a metaphor to describe the, fight, the, the soldier being a lion, giving the idea of, of great ferocity and uh, great uh, authority and, um, and great bravery. This is what, what things we, um, we, we consider to be Leonin um, attributes, things that you expect a lion to have. Uh, whereas um, Rowling, just thinking of a 21st century author at random, said the, that the soldier was very brave. She merely used an adjective. There's your terminology. The soldier was very brave. Um, so it would be wise to identify the two texts using the author's name. Um, now, how are you going to do this? I would suggest that you anchor the text in the 21st century. That is, you look at the 21st century text first because it will be easier for you to understand because we live in the 21st century. Uh, unless you're watching this in 100 years time, in which case I'm probably dead. Um, the <laughs> look for points that answer the specific question that you've been asked. So if you're asked to compare um, experience of ch experiences of childhood, uh, don't waffle on about uh, their uh, favourite meal uh, as an old man. You know, answer the specific question. Find something specific in the 21st century text and then find something either similar or contrasting in the 19th century text. Um, now, then you have to plan your answer. And I know you're all thinking, oh, plan answers. I can do that in my sleep. That's great, but you're not allowed to sleep during the exam. So here's my suggestion. I would suggest using a Venn diagram. This is where you put everything that's in one text, all the points you want to mention in one text, in one circle, and all the things you want to mention about the other text in the other circle, and then bring the two together so they overlap. And there'll be some things that are in both texts. Um, and this, therefore, you, you'll be able to write about things that are the same and things that are different. And that is uh, all my suggestions for the reading part of the exam. So shall we move on to writing? Well, if you'd like to, here we go. Section B is all about writing. Uh, and it is, of course, persuasive writing. That is, you're making an argument and you're trying to support that and you're trying to convert someone from your, their way of thinking to your way of thinking. If you want examples of persuasive writing, all advertisements everywhere ever have always been persuasive writing. You've always, they're always trying to uh, persuade you to buy their product, persuade you to use their service. 
most polit most political speeches are persuasive. They're persuading you to vote in a certain way or to think in a certain way. Uh, and thank goodness in this country we are able to uh, say, no, I choose not to think in that way. I would like to think in a different way. And therefore we vote for a different party. And there we go. Um, I think it was, uh, I can't remember who, I think it was someone, someone like Churchill once said, um, uh, democracy is the worst of all the political systems except all the others. <laughs> um, so there's 40 marks riding on this. This is once again, 50% of the paper, 30% of the overall GCSE mark. Um, you will have a choice of two. No, you won't. Let me say that again. You will have two questions and you will answer both questions. You will be doing two pieces of writing for this exam. I repeat that you will be doing two pieces of writing for this exam so that you haven't got time for time for looking around the room. OK. Uh, they will be marked. 12 marks for communication. So that's the, the lion's share is make sure you are you are communicating your point. You're making your point. But you'll also get eight marks for Vosbag. What's Vosbag? What's what's he talking about? Crazy man's talking about uh, Vosbag. He's just making words up. And I am. Vosbag is a, my short form of saying vocabulary, spelling, punctuation and grammar. Vosbag. And you get eight marks for using a wide range of vocabulary, accurate spelling, uh, a wide range of punctuation. So if you know how to use a, co a colon, use a colon. If you know how to use, if you don't know how to use an apostrophe, for goodness sake, learn. Because it's really annoying. There's only two uses of an apostrophe. Omissive and possessive. If you're using it to pluralize, then please, please, please slap yourself in the face right now. Don't actually do that. That was hyperbole. Um, so, yeah, you get eight marks for Vosbag, uh, 12 marks for communication. There's a set form format and formula um, for persuasive writing. And actually, this will serve you well whatever the whatever the structure you're writing. So if you're writing an article, this will work. If you're writing a letter, this will work. If you're writing a speech, this will work. Uh, and if you're just talking to your mate down the phone uh, after the exam, this will work then too. Start off with an introduction. That is, tell them what you're going to tell them. So if you've got three points to make, say, this article will talk about point A, point B, point C. You then tell them what point A, point B and point C are. And you explain them and you give evidence. Uh, you don't need a technique in this case, but you do need to make your three points uh, and you need to evidence them. And then you conclude by telling them what you've told them. Tell me if this is getting uh, getting obvious. Um, tell them what you're going to tell them. Tell them, tell them what you've told them. Your conclusion, concluding paragraph should echo, notice echo, not mirror, your um, introdu introductory paragraph. If you would like to know how to structure it a bit further, and you're thinking, oh, no, I can't take notes in. How will I remember this all? You have your notes here. That does not mean write notes on your hand. Don't do that. Don't do that. You'll get caught out, I assure you. Be like Rimmer on Red Dwarf. Just don't go there. You have a plan here. Your thumb represents an introduction. That is where you tell them what you're going to tell them. You tell them point one, point two, point three. You then have three more, three main body paragraphs. I've called them P1, P2 and P3. P1 
P here does not stand for pirate paragraph. P stands or for urine either. P here is point, evidence, explain. That's how you that's how you formulate your uh, formulate your structure. If you want to know how to structure your paragraph, you start with a um, a topic sentence. That the first sentence should be a topic sentence. So that's the point. You make your point in the first sentence. You then present evidence to back it up, and then you explain why the evidence backs it up. If you would like to then add a fifth sentence, which is a good idea, by the way, your fifth sentence should be uh, a linking sentence, linking on to the next one. Imagine you're from Lincolnshire. Uh, that's one of those jokes I probably shouldn't make. I apologise to all Lincolnshire people. Um, and then, finally, a conclusion. You write your concluding paragraph. Where you, which again echoes your introduction. So you say, I have taught in this article, I have talked about point one, point two, point three, uh, and I have shown how this uh, this will affect society in some bizarre way. So as you're going in, you've got everything you need to right here. Let's look at a couple of types of questions you might get. You might be asked to write an article, for example. So an article has specific types of language. It is informal, but also impersonal. So you're not writing to anyone directly. You're writing for a general audience. Um, it is informal. That means you don't have to write uh, as if Her Majesty the Queen, God bless her, is um, is reading it. You just have to write uh, as if your mum's going to read it, but you don't write it to your mum. Depending on your relationship with your mum, I suppose. It will have headings and subheadings. It will very likely use emotive language. These are good ways to get uh, get it going. Emotive, by the way, is the, is can is the e of da forest. If you want to do something cunning when you when you go in, and you're just making notes, write on your question paper as soon as you get in, da forest. Now you all know what da forest stands for: direct address, alliteration, facts. Opinion, or possibly onomatopoeia, if you want to be fun and funky, uh, but that's a difficult one to spell. Um, where have I got to? Ah, repetition. Ah, repetition. Ah, repetition. I see what I did there. Sorry. Um, e would be emotive language. S could be statistics, or possibly similes, if you want to go uh, go that way. And T could be the rule of three, also known as triplets. Where you have, you, you you make a point of saying three things at once. This, if you want to just write down those devices and then try and put them in throughout, uh, that would be a good resource for you, and it would mean you haven't don't have to think about it every time you're trying to use it because it'll be there. It'll be something you can reference. You can't take it into the exam. Don't take notes into the exam, but you can you can make use of it uh, if you write it yourself on the question paper. Another style you might a style of question you might have is a letter. Um, here we've got a letter from Harry Potter and a le letter from um, from C.S. Lewis in at the beginning of *Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe* um, as examples. Why not? The letter is a slightly different type of a type of writing but it's it's very similar so it's probably going to be more formal you're probably going to be asked to write to uh, the principal of the of the college or to your MP or to Her Majesty the Queen God bless her probably not Her Majesty the Queen uh, possibly Prince Charles um, 
you need uh, so you're you should be using formal language but it can be personal you can use personal address you need to think about this it is your responsibility i would like you to um give take my take my complaints to the prime minister You should start it with dear sir or possibly dear madam, depending on who you if you know who you're writing to or not. You might if it's to Her Majesty to you, you just you just write to um, you just write uh, your your majesty and then put at the bottom your humble servant. But if, you, <laughs> if you're not writing to, to the Queen, um, dear sir or dear Mrs. Johnson. You would use the name if the name if you know it. If you don't know it, dear sir or dear madam. If you're in any doubt, dear sir. If it's dear sir, you f you end it with either yours faithfully, or any banal ones such as uh, kind regards, yours, uh, yours, just yours is, is fine. Um, notice that in the C.S. Lewis example I've put up there, he ends it. Your affectionate godfather, C.S. Lewis. He's writing to uh, Lucy Barfield, um, on, on whom Lucy in Narnia was probably based. But there's some discussion about that. If you start, dear sir, you end yours faithfully. If you'd start, dear Mr. Johnson, you say yours sincerely. The two S's don't go together. That's how you remember that bit. I'm going on a bit. Let's move on. This is it is a direct address you are directly addressing that person ladies and gentlemen i believe we have reached the, the uh, we have looked through what you can expect from this exam the last thing is to say good luck and and don't worry guys you've got this you can pass this you know you can. Thanks very much for joining me. Thanks for thanks for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this. I hope that uh, you will uh, will consider subscribing, sharing, or just writing a comment about uh, how how awesome my hair is. Whatever you do, I'm looking forward to uh, to hearing that you've all passed the exam. God bless. Bye.